So good morning. Welcome to Park Church. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Park. Uh, we're glad to see you. This morning is Parktoberfest. If you're new, we don't do this every week. Uh, it would be cool if we did, but we don't. So there's a whole bunch of people and balloons. There's a bounce house coming. Uh, we really hope that you're able to come and stick around and have a lot of fun there. Uh, but welcome. This morning, we're wrapping up our series called Return. This is a series where we're looking at stories of people in the New Testament who have turned to Jesus or who are returning to Jesus to follow him uh, because that's what we want for you. We want you to turn to Jesus and follow him. We're not going to make any secrets about that. We want that because that's what Jesus wants for you. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to be with him and to go with him. And so far, we've looked at uh, Paul and we've looked at Levi. And last week, or two weeks ago, we looked at Peter. And this morning, we're looking again at uh, Peter. There he is. That's an old mosaic from a church in somewhere. I forget. Um, Doesn't matter. The story of Peter that we're going to dive into this morning comes from the very end of the Gospel of John. Uh, This is after Jesus has been crucified. He's been raised from the dead. Uh, Peter, though, Peter's left following Jesus. He's gone, and he is back to doing what he did before he followed Jesus. He's fishing. Uh, He knows that Jesus is alive. And yet, he's on, he's on the lake fishing. Uh, he has given up on Jesus. But we'll see, Jesus was not ready to give up on him. Wherever you are or aren't in faith, there are times, there will be times, where it's just easier to give up. Because, because why? Because it's too hard. Or because it's disappointing. Or sometimes it's just too hard to believe. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Or you don't see the fruit of your faith. And so it's just easier to give up. If you have ever felt that way, or if you feel that way now, uh, Peter's story speaks right to you. Because, like Peter, we're all human. Humans tend to want to give up on things because it gets hard sometimes. But Peter's story gives us great uh, strength and hope. It's what makes Peter such an, inc- such an intriguing character uh, in the New Testament, because he's just like us. In Jesus, we meet someone who is God, who is God with us. He's the perfect human also. He's the perfect version of what we are meant to be. In Peter, we just meet ourselves, warts and all. So let's get right into it. Uh, Here's our story. It begins in uh, the 21st chapter of John. And here we go. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the, to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Uh, gathered there were Simon Peter, that's Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out, got into their boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, if you were here two weeks ago, this story might sound familiar because it's awfully reminiscent of the one, the first one we heard about uh, with Peter uh, in the Gospel of Luke. As you might remember, in that story, uh, we meet Peter after a long night of unsuccessful fishing. He's standing there at the bank of the lake. He's mending his nets uh, as Jesus is teaching. Uh, it's, It's the same lake, too, the same sea. In Luke, it's the Sea of Galilee. Here, it's the Sea of Tiberias. But it's d- different words for the same place. Uh, in that story, back then, Jesus asked Peter to go fishing. Take me fishing, please. And so Peter does. They go out. They catch a great haul of fish, too many fish for them to carry back. And it, and it clicks for Peter. And he recognizes Jesus as Lord. And he follows him. He, they get back to the shore. He leaves all of his boats behind. And He follows him. And for years, Peter and a bunch of other apostles, they gave their entire lives to following Jesus. Everything they had, all their time, energy, efforts, everything. Now, Peter, uh, besides Jesus, of course, Peter is the person in the New Testament who gets the most words about him. Um, More stories are about him. Uh, He's the guy who's kind of the first among equals of the disciples, Um, He's the one who Jesus gives the most attention to and most direction to. Uh, But he's also the first one to put his foot in his mouth. Um, He's the first one to volunteer only to fall flat on his face. He's first in ill-timed boldness and misplaced confidence. 
and as admirable and as uh, well-intended as Peter was, he failed a lot. Some in big ways, some in small ways. Uh, the big ways are noticeable, though. The biggest one uh, is, happened on the night that Jesus was arrested and was um, before he was ultimately killed. Earlier that day, Jesus told his disciples what would happen, that he would be arrested, um, and that they would actually deny him and abandon him. Uh, and Peter, Peter absolutely denied it. Jesus said to Peter, uh, look, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And then after you do that, the rooster's going to crow. And Peter, it says, vehemently responded, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Peter's intentions, his professed faith, are admirable, but you know what happens. He denies Jesus three times, standing outside of the gate of the high priest's house, where inside, Jesus is being interrogated and beaten. Outside, Peter stands there trying to warm himself by a charcoal fire because it was a cold night. A little servant girl comes up to Peter, recognizing him as one of Jesus' followers, and asks them, hey, weren't you with that guy? And Peter said, no, no, not me. And then he denied it again, and then again. And then he heard the rooster crow, and he remembered what Jesus said, and he got out of there. He ran away, and as Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us, he broke down, and he wept bitterly. After having faith in Jesus, Peter turns his back on him. He leaves him ultimately to die. Peter wasn't even there to see Jesus die. The women who followed Jesus, they were there. But Peter, at best, Peter was at a, dis at a safe distance watching. But in the end, he walks away from it all. Bitterly, he, he walks away from Jesus. And so, what does he do then? He goes back to fishing. He returned to what he did before he followed Jesus, fishing. But, as you see up there, he catches nothing. He comes up, again, empty, nothing. Uh, if you know the Gospel of John really well, you might remember that earlier in the Gospel of John, Jesus says this to Peter, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Those two nothings, it's the same exact word. Peter has returned to fishing and he found that he can no longer do it. He, he can do nothing because he's apart from Jesus. He's left Jesus behind. Now for most of you, I don't know where you are or aren't in faith. Whether you're apart from Jesus or whether you're very close to him. Whether you're just turning to him or you're returning to him or maybe you're turning away from him to walk away, to go back to fishing. Wherever you are, I want you to pause and think for a moment. Does it sometimes feel, and maybe even right now, does it feel like your nets are coming up empty? Like Peter, you're just catching nothing. If you are, maybe it's because you're trying to do it apart from Jesus rather than with him. So Peter returns to fishing. Now, this is interesting. Why does Peter return to fishing? This is strange. Peter knows Jesus has been raised from the dead. Before Jesus died, Jesus told him, Peter, I will be crucified and dead, and then I will be raised. Peter doesn't get that. Okay, it might have been a little confusing. Uh, on that Sunday morning, Easter morning, when Jesus was raised from the dead, Peter actually went to Jesus' tomb. He got there. He sees it empty. He goes inside and see that the linens used to wrap up Jesus were gone. He sees that Jesus is no longer there it still doesn't click for him. Okay. Uh, later, Jesus appears to the disciples, including Peter, at night. He shows them his hands and the wounds. Peter still doesn't get it. Peter knows that Jesus is alive. He's seen him. And yet, he's not following. He's fishing. So why? Why? Because when it comes to following Jesus, Peter thinks that he's disqualified. Peter thinks that he returns to fishing because he thinks that after what he's done, the way he's denied Jesus and walked away, he has been disqualified from being a follower of Jesus. And so he gives up. 
Do you maybe sometimes go at life apart from Jesus because you think you also have been disqualified? You used to maybe be a real follower of Jesus, but for whatever reason you've walked away. Maybe something bad has happened and it's ruined your view of faith and of God and you couldn't believe anymore, so you've decided just to walk away from it all. Maybe you've had circumstances. Life just got too hard or life just got too busy and something had to go and so you kissed following Jesus goodbye. Or you did something wrong and you know it and everyone else knew it and you can't possibly lift your eyes to Jesus in prayer anymore and you couldn't possibly find your way to get into church and be surrounded by people who you know are doing a better job than you. Or maybe you sit there today and from the outside it looks like you're doing a good job following Jesus. Doing good, doing good, doing good. But inside, you know there's something inside of your heart that's not following Jesus. Internally, you've walked away from him. And you sit here listening this morning, uh, knowing what you know about Jesus, knowing what you know about yourself, knowing what you know about how you've walked away, and you're thinking, just like Peter, well, I'm out. I'm disqualified. And here's the thing about this. If you've even had a taste of what it's like to follow Jesus and you feel like you're not part of that anymore, it hurts. Peter wept bitterly, not just because of the shame of his failings, not just because turning his back on Jesus, sin fosters emptiness inside of us, not only because he couldn't even tell the truth to a little servant girl, but because when you're apart from Jesus, You're apart from life itself. You're apart from life himself. We were meant to live our lives with Jesus, to follow him. And it hurts us when we don't. Going at life without Jesus, as Peter attempts here, it's not a good idea. Its result, it's up there. Nothing. Except Peter becomes a sad, depressed, and unsuccessful fisherman. Thankfully, the story does not end there. And I'm not going to put the next part up there because it's too long, but I'll tell you what happens. So they're done fishing on their way back of failed fishing. It's daybreak now. It's almost morning when they're about 100 yards off from shore. They couldn't recognize him yet because of the morning fog. But Jesus is there. And he asks them, hey, how did the fishing go? And I understand that if you're a fisherman and you've caught nothing, this is the worst question to be asked. And they told him, we're coming back empty. Uh, And Jesus tells him, all right, hold on, stay there, try this. Cast the nets on the other side and see what you get. And they do, and they bring up a haul of fish that's too much for them to bring in the boats. It's too heavy. Uh, Too many fish, again, just like when Peter first turned to Jesus. Uh, John tells what happens in his own words. He said, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John's way of referring to himself. Uh, The disciple, I know, I don't know if he's like, just, I mean, if Jesus really loved me like that too, I would be proud anyway. Uh, That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked. I don't know why he was naked. Uh, And he jumped into the sea. Two things I want you to notice about John and Peter. Um, These are not the main points, but they're good points nonetheless. Uh, John recognizes Jesus before Peter does. Um, He beats him to it, and that's okay. Because no two disciples, no two discipleships uh, are going to look exactly alike. So you don't have to worry about um, comparing your following Jesus with the person next to you. Or with the person who preaches up here. Or the author you love. Or the Christian you've always looked up to in faith. It's you and it's Jesus. No competition, uh, no need to compare. And second, this is just simple but profound. Sometimes we need someone else to point out Jesus to us when we can't see him ourselves. Hence worship. Hence community groups. Hence just following Jesus together. So Peter comes ashore. So the rest of the rest of the disciples. Um, if you think about it for a minute, for a minute uh, Peter leaves the disciples who have these fish that they can't even carry uh, back to shore. 
Peter gets there ahead of them, and he leaves the rest of them to be lugging all these fish back. Um, it's kind of a jerk move. But so Peter continues, or John continues writing. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. I'll stop there. Another charcoal fire. You remember the other charcoal fire in the Gospel of John? I mentioned it earlier. Peter remembers it. It was on that night where Jesus was betrayed and arrested and Peter denied him three times. Peter warmed himself on a charcoal fire. These are the only two mentions of that in the entire New Testament. When John wrote this, surely he meant to signal us, his readers, that there was a connection between that night and this morning. Just like the charcoal fire itself signaled a connection for Peter. Because you know what's unmistakable about a charcoal fire? The smell. Nothing brings you back. Nothing can uh, bring you back in time and put you back in the moment like a smell does. Uh, in June, a few months back, we had a fire at our house. Um, not like in our chimney, like a fire at our house. Um, <laughs> I'm sitting watching TV, working on my computer around 11 o'clock at night, and uh, I hear the air conditioner try to kick on. I hear a weird popping noise, and I think, oh, I think our air conditioner just broke. Not a big deal. A few thousand bucks later, whatever. Uh, that actually is a big deal. What am I talking about? Uh, <laughs> um, I'm sitting there working. Five minutes later, I look up. I see orange glowing out of our window. I just run up, say a bunch of words I shouldn't say, uh, go to the window. I look outside of the window, and I see flames shooting up on the side of our house, like next to the side of our house. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I, I run upstairs freaking out. My wife is pregnant, so I'm like, get up. Get Eli out of the house. Eli lives on that side of the house. The fire was on this side. Um, Zeke, our older kid, lives on this side of the house. His window is right above where these flames are, you know. It looks like an inferno to me. Um, so I go into his room. He doesn't live in a normal bed. He is in a loft bed. So I can't just scoop him up. I have to climb up the ladder. I have to tear him out by his legs, carry him downstairs. We get downstairs. We get him out of the house. I come back in. I get my fire extinguisher. We run on the side of the house, trying to put it out. Uh, it, it was quite a scene. What ended up happening was our air conditioning unit caused a fire, caused the mulch to go on fire. And it was a really windy night. It was dry in June. And so all of our pine trees on the side of the house, our 15-foot pine tree, like lit up on fire, started to melt the siding off the house. Um, like our gas goes into the house right there. So it was, potentially it was a disaster. Um, fire department comes. Our neighbors yelling at the cop. It is a scene. Uh, no real damage, though. I mean, you know, nothing inside of the house, no smoke damage or anything, um, just outside of the house. Uh, but... We've gotten it all fixed up. New air conditioning unit. We got the siding done finally. And so when it comes down to it, I, I really have forgotten about it. Um, it's not part of our lives anymore. I ignore it. Except every once in a while, I'll come home, and I'll open the car door, and I'll get a whiff of smoke. And it immediately sends me right back to that night. You know, our neighbors have a chimney or something, and I'll smell that smoke, and immediately I am back in the craziness. Barefoot with a fire extinguisher, uh, kids crying, fire department, praying they get there before the house goes up. When Peter gets a whiff of that charcoal fire, he is back that night in all of the guilt, in all of the weeping, in all of his depression, bitterly weeping. His mind and his heart are racing. His blood is pumping differently as the overbearing weight of guilt and shame from that night rushes on him. Jesus next asks Peter to, to bring him the fish and uh, Jesus, uh, Peter throws the fish at Jesus' feet. Look at what happens next. He says, <clears throat> when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Jesus asks Peter the question that addresses the heart of the matter for Peter and the heart of the matter for any of us who give up on Jesus. Uh, the these up there, who does that refer to? Some people think that it refers to, you know, Peter, do you love me more than the, the other disciples love me? Some people think it's, it's Peter, do you love me more or do you love these disciples more? Uh, I think, and what a lot of people think is, 
He actually means the fish and fishing. You know, Peter, do you love me more than these? This fish and fishing. Because it seems like you love them more than me. Because you know I'm alive and you're not following me anymore. What's the deal? When Amanda and I were dating, I used to love playing roller hockey. And I would play all the time. And I would tell her, uh, I'll be back at 8 o'clock and then we'll hang out for the rest of the night. If it was a good game, I would be hours late. I'm talking like 11 o'clock at night. It's a miracle that she stayed with me all that time. But she used to say, it seems like you love hockey more than you love me. Is that right? Like, uh, no, but <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't get to play hockey all the time. Um, this is the same question here. Peter, do you love me or do you love the fish? Which is it? For Jesus, though, he isn't a girlfriend uh, who's feeling frustrated. He's asking Peter the most important question he could be asked. What do you believe in more? Do you believe in your voice or do you believe in mine? Do you believe in the voice uh, that tells you that because of what you've done, you are disqualified? And so you may as well go back to fishing. Or do you believe in me who has come to you to get you back? Do you believe what your record says, what your uh, bitterness, what your pain, what your guilt says? Because if you're going to believe those things, then, yeah, you may as well go fishing. Or do you believe in me, who's here to restore you? The question that Jesus is really asking is, who do you trust more? The voice of your sin or the voice of your Savior? As we give up on Jesus and are in a position to turn or to return to him. This is the question that all of us need to be asked. And so I'll ask it to you right now. Who do you trust more? The voice of your sin or the voice of your Savior? Because if the voice inside of you, the voice of your sin, or the voice that you hear other people saying, holding your sin against you, or the voice of religion that says that you're not good enough for God, or the voice of your upbringing that says you're not good enough for anything. Or the voice, any of the voices that echo in your mind whenever you smell your charcoal fire, whatever that might be. If that voice says to you that you are disqualified from following Jesus and you believe it, and so you've given up and you're back to fishing, you have to hear the rest of Peter's story. Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. But a second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter's like, this is a little weird. I just said yes. Is short-term memory loss a side effect of resurrection? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter, Peter felt hurt because he said to them a third time, do you love me? And he said, to them, he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Can you see what Jesus is doing here? Jesus is undoing Peter's threefold denial with a threefold affirmation of love, reconciliation, restoration, of recommissioning him as his follower, as an under-shepherd of his sheep. Peter didn't need signs and wonders to return to Jesus. He didn't need the catch of fish. He didn't need powerful teaching. He didn't need proof or to be successful. He didn't need to fix anything. What he needed was to be back in that boat in the Sea of Galilee with nothing to lose. He needed Jesus himself to meet him where he was in the midst of his failure, in the midst of his pain, and to address him right there. And that's what Jesus does. It shows you how uh, personal a relationship with Jesus could be, that he knows you exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you need, just like a shepherd knows exactly what the sheep need. This wasn't for Jesus' benefit. He knew Peter loved him. He knows everything. Peter said so himself. This was for Peter's. Because Jesus knows that Peter needed to have that threefold denial undone in a threefold experience of forgiveness in order to make it his own. So like a good therapist, he walks Peter from uh, pain to healing. 
for you who want to return to Jesus, but you can't get past the voice of disqualification, listen, this is Jesus. He knows what you need. He does not hold your sin against you. The record of wrongs that stands against you, it no longer exists. He's nailed it to the cross. He's not interested in rehashing your past. These are all present tense words up here. He didn't needle Peter with, you know, what you did was wrong. That's what we do. That's not what Jesus does. He's not interested in rehashing your sin and your guilt to make sure you're really, really sorry or you have the right attitude about you or you're able to pull yourselves up without him. He comes to Peter right where he is and he comes to you this morning right where you are, right in the midst of his failure. Not after he's gotten his act together, but before. Jesus doesn't reveal himself to people who are perfect. He reveals himself to people who are not. People who are walking away from him. He reveals himself to disciples who are failing at being disciples. And he comes to us. He comes to you, not ever because you're qualified, but precisely because you're not. The voice that tells you you've been disqualified from following Jesus, that voice would be exactly right, if not for Jesus, who comes to you and has qualified you by the death on his cross, who, uh, who has disqualified anything that could ever disqualify you, who has forgiven you and who holds out life for you because he wants you back on his side, on his team, because he loves you. He wants to restore you because he loves you. That's the whole deal. It's what it's all about. He will never give up on you because he loves you and he calls you now to turn to him, to follow him, to entrust yourself to him and let him work on you, to restore you, just like he restored Peter. If you want to figure out how to do that, come back next week and come back the week after. Join a community group. Reach out to someone else in the church and say, you look like you've been doing this for some time. Help me follow Jesus. Write it on a connect card and we'll help you uh, figure out how to follow Jesus. Now, this, um, this restoration, it's not just forgiveness, because freedom from the past is only half the deal. Uh, it's also freedom for the future, freedom to serve, to be commissioned, to be recommissioned up here, uh, to do the work that Jesus calls us to do. You know, this is all about work when it comes down to it. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. All different ways of saying, take care of the people who I have entrusted to you to take care of. Love for Jesus uh, is not first put in practice by emotional outbursts or by private, de private devotion upwards. It's by love outwards to the part of the church or to the part of the world that Jesus entrusts to you. And uh, this, this commissioning, it's not just for Peter, but it's for me and it's for every person who uh, takes up Jesus' call to follow him. And it's also the calling of our church to be under shepherds, with Jesus as our good shepherd, taking care, tending to, feeding the people who he puts in our path. Whether it's the person sitting next to you on Sundays, or the person who you sit next to Monday through Friday. Whether it's the child who you love and would do anything for, or whether it's the neighbor that you cannot stand. Whether it's uh, the person who is a joy to be with, you love to be with them, or whether it's the person who is just a drain. Jesus entrusts them to us. And our love for Jesus will show or not show in how we care for them. This is the calling that Peter, that Peter receives and that we receive too. And it's a challenging calling. It demands more from you and more from us than we can supply on our own. It's, it's meant to cost us something. And really, we can't do it without God. And God helps us. Look at how Jesus continues with Peter. He says, Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt to go where you wished. But when you grew old, when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Jesus here predicts Peter's own death, his own martyrdom. Fastening the belt was an image for, um, like, 
fastening the chains around someone who was a prisoner. Stretching his hands was an image uh, for the way Peter would stretch his hands on the cross because Peter was also crucified. Jesus, the good shepherd, has laid down his life for Peter and someday following Jesus, he will learn what it means and he will do what it actually means to follow him. He will be led where he doesn't wish to go, where following Jesus takes him. And this is precisely the point Once you turn or return to Jesus, if you're following Jesus, faith will sometimes lead you where you do not wish to go. It will lead you where you're afraid to go. But listen, we can go there, not because we're strong, but because we're following him, who in the words of Hebrews is the pioneer of our faith. He goes before us to lead us to where we have not been. And that is actually what the subject of our next sermon series is going to be about. You've turned to Jesus, now where does he lead you next? Faith, that is faith in Jesus, the pioneer, is faith that will lead you where you have not been. Into your pain, into your doubts, into your fears, into hope that you haven't had before. Into a future you didn't know could be so good. Into the world. We're going to kick that off next Sunday and I invite you to come back for that next Sunday. So Jesus concludes his restoration of Peter, finally, with one more call, and this is how we're going to conclude our return series. It's just two simple words that sums it up better than a thousand sermons could ever sum it up. After this, he said to him, follow me. This is the call that counts. This is the future of your faith and the future of mine. This is the future of our church in the world. And this is the future that we look forward to walking into together. If it's your turn to to turn or to return to Jesus today, listen to this call. Not as me reading it off the screen to someone else, but listen to it as God speaking to you directly the words of Jesus' mouth. Follow me. Jesus is calling you and wants you to follow him today. If you hear Jesus speaking to you, then pray along with me now. Let us know on a connect card so we can figure out how to move forward in faith together. Let's pray. Jesus, we hear your call to follow you. We want to accept it and receive it, but we need your help to do that. So help us receive this call. Help us to turn. Help us to return and follow you. Lord, help us to put away the things that have held us back. Help us to to move past them. Give us the courage to sacrifice those things which we might stand to lose to follow you. Show us the way forward so that it's clear to us. Show us where you want us to go like a shepherd who leads his sheep. Give us the ability to do this. Give us the power to do this. Give us your spirit to be able to do this. Lord, help us to take care of of the people who you have put in our lives to take care of. Give us your spirit so that we can do that better than we can do it without you. Lord, be our pioneer and go before us where we have not been. Walk with us, walk ahead of us, and help us along the way. Lord, we we thank you that you do not leave us where we are but you come to us where we are to call us to follow you. We thank you that that day you didn't leave Peter and those disciples in the boat without you, but you came to them and called them again. We thank you, God, that you chase after us with mercy to bring us back to you, not to punish us, not to rub it in our faces what we've done wrong, but to forgive us, to set us on our own two feet, and to set us free to follow you. We thank you, Lord, that you are our way, our light, our life, and our guide. For those of us who feel far from you now, Lord Jesus, chase after us until we are found. And lead us back to you. Take us by the hand. Join us now as we worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.